Good morning, everyone. I'm Kendall Trump with Grain Journal Magazine in Decatur, Illinois. Welcome to Top Hazards in the Grain Industry, Serious Injury and Fatality Prevention. This is the first in a series of webinars to be presented by Jeeps and Grain Journal Magazine in 2020. Today's webinar is sponsored by M&M Specialty Services. M&M specializes in protecting your people and your products with the best in quality and affordability in personal protection products, grain protectants, fumigants, and services. They are based in Leavenworth, Kansas. Today's webinar is also sponsored by VAA LLC, who has provided engineering and design services in the agribusiness industry since its founding in 1978. Working with owners, equipment vendors, and design-build contractors, the firm specializes in bulk commodity handling facilities, including slip form design, material handling, transportation, and export. They are based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Our presenter today is Joe Milnick. Joe is a graduate of Bowling Green State University with a degree in environmental policy and analysis. Joe began his safety career in 1996 and has since worked in industries including grain handling, milling, processing, manufacturing, insurance, construction, and maritime. In addition, Joe has over 15 years of experience in the grain industry. Joe holds certifications as a certified safety professional and an occupational health and safety technologist through the Bureau of Certified Safety Professionals. Joe is also a member of the Jeep Seaway Chapter and the National Grain and Feed Association. You can participate in today's Q&A session Oh, excuse me. Sorry. Joe is also a content creation expert for Safety Made Simple, Inc., an online safety training provider. Safety Made Simple offers online safety training on a variety of subjects, including courses specific to the industry. You can submit questions today and participate in our Q&A session by typing your questions into the Ask a Question box at any time during our presentation. We will be addressing your question during the Q&A session following our presentation. As a note, today's webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to our website, grainnet.com, within 24 hours. All registrants will also receive an email containing a link to the recording the day following the presentation. We will now begin today's webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Joe Milnick. Good morning, Kendall. Thank you. And uh, first off, I just wanted to thank Jeeps for uh, providing me the opportunity to talk to, to each of you today. Um, Kendall was just uh, informing me that we had about 200 people register for uh, today's webinar, which is, was, is just excellent. So I thank each of you for taking time out of your, your busy schedules to, uh, to listen to a little bit about uh, safety. And I know a lot of you don't have safety in your title. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't be a, a safety leader at your organization. Um, this topic is one that I've uh, never really presented in webinar form. I presented a topic at a Jeep's uh, Seaway chap chapter conference um, last spring, and uh, I was asked to give a talk on common hazards in the grain industry. And quite frankly, when I got to putting it together, I thought it was um, a little boring, so I decided to kind of change change the presentation to reflect on you know the top five things in the grain industry that could cause a serious injury or fatality. And I had a really good turnout for the session. Um, we had probably 60 to 70 percent of the total conference attendees in the session. A lot of interaction, a lot of interest by people. Um, so when Jeeps came to me and, and asked me uh, if I'd like to do a webinar, I thought we could. Uh, share some of that information, and I've added some as well. So my uh, my goal today is is really to talk a little bit about uh, serious injuries and fatalities uh, prevention in the grain industry, some of the activities that I think um, have that SIF potential. Um, and I think as an attendee, um, you know, maybe just judge whether you're you're heading in the right direction or you already have an adequate program. Or, you know, as a presenter, my goal is always for somebody to take an idea or two maybe back to their facility or their company and, and try to implement it to improve things. So um, with that, we can, uh, we'll go ahead and get started today. So what I'd like to talk about today are, um, you know, what are serious injuries and fatalities, um, I wanna, which we call SIFs is the acronym. 
Um, we'll talk a little bit about identification of SIFs. Excuse me. Um, SIF potential in the grain industry. I have a list of five things that are of particular interest based on my experience. Your list may differ. And then we'll talk a little bit toward the end on addressing what we call SIF precursors. So really when we look at injuries, you know, I think we can put them into two different distinct categories. We have what we call, you know, a non-serious injury or serious injuries and fatalities or SIFs. And, and serious injuries and fatalities are generally things that are life-threatening, life-altering, or cause permanent disability. And I think historically, uh, many organizations have focused their efforts on non-serious inju injuries, things like frequency rates, those types of things. Um, and I, I relate that to my own experience. You know, I started back in safety in the mid-90s, and um, a lot of emphasis on the companies that I, that I worked with um, surrounded things that were first aid cases and preventing recordables, uh, things that had little or no uh, potential to have, you know, what we call SIF potential. And I think uh, over time, this, this uh, focus has changed quite a bit. So when we look at a life-threatening injury, um, this is something that if not addressed immediately is likely to lead to death. Um, it usually requires emergency response personnel to provide some type of life-sustaining support as well. So examples are things like lacerations or crushing injuries with a, a lot of blood loss. You can have serious burns, uh, chest or abdominal trauma affecting some of the vital organs, um, and injuries to the brain or, or spinal cord. So again, those are life-threatening types of injuries. And then we have what we call life-altering or permanent disability-related injuries. Um, these are the types of injuries that, that result in uh, permanent or long-term impairment or loss of the use of an internal organ or part of the body. Um, so examples of this would be significant head injuries, uh, spinal cord injuries, uh, paralysis, and, and amputations as well. So generally with the causal factors of, of SIFs, um, and these are, you know, as well as the life-threatening and life-altering injuries, they offer different differ a little bit from the non-serious injuries. So some of the potential causes are things like non-routine work. So non-routine work or non-production activities, I kind of, they, you can kind of group those together. So these are things that are not routine or repetitive when we think of a production type environment. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about non-routine work uh, later in the presentation. And I actually think that many of the things that we do in the grain industry um, can be categorized as uh, non-routine work. Um, there's also uh, causes of, of SIFs as well. Kendall, I'm, I'm having a little bit of problem with the transition here. I was wondering if you could kind of take over it, you know. I'll sure, no problem. to be bouncing around. Which slide would you like to be on? Um, we, we can start with this one. This one will work fine. Okay, thank you. So, so the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, you know, some of the, you know, the focus when we talk about we've, we've been focusing on these non-serious injuries, um, you can tell that that's the focus because we've continued to see these, these non-serious injury rates decrease. Um, the unfortunate thing is that severe injury or serious injuries and fatalities have actually increased um, in the last several years, and that graph indicates that. So, and we can advance to the next one. So recent BLS data um, indicates that there's about 2.8 million non-fatal work injuries and illnesses in 2018. That was somewhat unchanged, while the fatality re rate crept up 2%. Now, a lot of times we can attribute, you know, statistics are a funny thing. I actually had a textbook in college on how to lie with statistics. And you're going to see a lot of statistics here around election time, and you don't know what to believe. And you can kind of uh, mold statistics to say exactly what you want. But I think the fact that there was an increase is pretty important. Now, the rate itself has remained the same as far as fatalities at 3.5 per 100,000 workers. Uh, but you can attribute that to some factors. I mean, the economy is booming right now. We have very low unemployment, um, and you can dilute rates pretty quickly with man hours and things of that nature. But when we talk about fatalities, you know, 3.5 fatalities per 100,000 full-time workers, I was thinking about this yesterday. It's like, how do you quantify that? So I think the best way to, to visualize that, and when we talk about statistics, the one thing that I don't like about statistics, particularly with fatalities and injuries, is we don't put a face with them. 
And these are people that we're talking about. So here in the state of Ohio, um, we have a, a football stadium in Columbus that if you come to Jeeps Exchange in 2021, um, you might be able to take a tour of, and it's called the Horseshoe at Ohio State. It holds over 100,000 people. But just to visualize this, if I had 100,000 people in that stadium, I went out to center field, uh, right out at midfield, and I, uh, I called out four names and brought them down to, to the 50-yard line. And I introduced those people as, hey, these are the four people that are going to die out of the 100,000 people that are here today. That puts a completely different spin. It kind of humanizes statistics a little bit. So one of the recent trends that many organizations have, have done, and your organization may have taken this, undertaken this as, as many as 10 years ago um, or, or even longer, is to start to focus on and, and somewhat shift or find a better balance between non-serious injury prevention to preventing SIFs. Um, it doesn't mean that non-serious injuries aren't important to prevent. It's just rather that maybe we shift our approach. There have been, that I'm aware of, just in the last year, some fatalities in the grain industry that have happened at companies that have pretty low incident rates. Um, and we see a fatality. So it's, you know, fatality prevention to me is probably one of the things that we start with when we work with clients is one of the first things we, we start to talk about. Kind of we can move to the next slide. So there's some SIF identification opportunities. And these are things that I think anybody can do not regardless of the size of your company or how, how uh, large or expansive your safety program is, and there are additional opportunities as well, but these are the three that I'm going to focus on today, is really this idea of you know, near-miss incidents, um, incident analysis on non-serious injuries, and employee engagement are all opportunities uh, to identify SIF potential in the work environment. Next slide. So near-miss reporting, and, and we've done a number of, of uh, near-miss webinars uh, with Grain Journal over the years, and I know that they're kept out in their archives on GrainNet if you want to learn more. But this is really just a great tool for uncovering exposure in the workplace. Um, you know, my background with this is when I worked in, in corporate safety, we put a program like this into place, and I know that company's still using it. They've probably identified ten to th ten, tens of thousands of exposure incidents in the last 10 years. Um, that are things that they can identify exposure, drive it from the workplace, identify SIF potential, those types of things. So the data derived from near-miss reporting is, is analyzed, and you can really identify those incidents with SIF potential. But the incident analysis piece is really critical because when we look at uh, non-serious injuries um, and even near-misses just at the surface level, we don't always uh, realize the SIF potential. So I threw an example in here. So we've got an employee working in a truck receiving area. They cross between two trucks that are in line. They're approximately five feet apart. And, you know, that's reported as a near miss. And that's something, yeah, we, we shouldn't do that. Somebody could get injured. But when you think about that, that's an example of a near miss with SIF potential. If I have the, the uh, truck in the front back up or the, the one in the back pull forward, we can easily uh, severely injure somebody, seriously injure somebody, or even kill them. So near misses are, are very important. Next slide. So incident analysis as well, you know, it's really important to have an incident analysis process to get past the surface level analysis that's often performed uh, on non-serious injuries and, and even these near misses. Um, one thing that struck me in, in prepping for the webinar today, uh, Decker Insight, you know, they do, they have a lot of data out there, a lot of studies that they do. And in one particular study, uh, it showed the percentage of non-serious injuries that have potential for SIF exposure ranged from 10 to 36%. So, you know, to put that into perspective, if I had a, an organization, say it's a large cooperative of 500 full-time employees, um, they have 10 non-serious injuries. Anywhere from one to four of those incidents could have resulted in a serious injury or fatality. And that's determined through further analysis. So, again, incident analysis is very important to get past the surface level. Next slide. So if you don't have a, a, a formal incident analysis uh, process at your company, um, there are some easy ways to do that. Uh, there are some off-the-shelf products, you know, Taproot and others. Um, but simple 5Y process is one. And I use a, a, a fishbone diagram and, or an Ishikawa diagram. 
and we've we've actually done a webinar, I think a couple of them on incident analysis for Grain Journal as well that would be in their archives. Uh, I think 5Y is okay for um, non-serious with, without CIF-related potential. The, the thing about 5Y analysis is you can somewhat steer that sometimes the way that you want to take it, and sometimes that's toward, you know, that the employee did something wrong, that kind of thing. Um, I learned of the Fishbone or Ishikawa diagram just um, learning about continuous improvement. I, I started my career uh, in safety uh, for the first three years in the automotive industry, and they used the, this this fishbone diagram for quality uh, quality concerns that when they came off a production line. And I kind of looked at it and said, well, we could use this for safety. And the thing that I liked about it is it actually looks at, you know, six different uh, potential causal factor groups. They call them the six M's sometimes. So you look at machines, methods, materials, you know, mother nature, the weather, uh, man, which would be the employee, those types of things. And it really forces us or, or leads us down six different paths to identify causal factors and then in turn identify the actual root cause. So incident analysis, very important um, part of identifying SIF potential. Next slide. So, you know, in lieu of that or in the absence of, you know, if you're an uh, organization that says, hey, you know what, I, we really don't have a formal incident analysis process. Is there some other way that we could identify SIF potential out in our, our facilities? And I'll tell you, this actually is my favorite way of doing it um, because I think it's just you can really extract some great information from your employees. And, uh, you know, back I mentioned earlier, I worked for a large agribusiness company, and we had a, a fatality in 2005. And afterward, we brought uh, Behavioral Science Technologies, which is was purchased by DECRA, and they were kind of front and foremost with behavioral-based safety. And this is one of the roads they took us down immediately after we had this fatality. Um, they noticed we had pretty good incident rates, but, you know, we had a fatality, and we wanted to prevent that in the future and make sure that didn't happen. So employee engagement is, is – this one is really simple. Anybody can do this. Um, we challenge a lot of our clients to do this. And that's just to form small focus groups at your facility or at your company. And I'm talking about focus groups that um, include your frontline operations employees, the people that are really out there in the working interface. And just sitting down and saying, listen, guys, I, I want to come up with a list of, of five to ten things at the facility, uh, hazards or activities that you perform that could seriously injure or even kill someone. And I think if you've never performed this, you'd be surprised what comes up, because as auditors, a lot of times, we don't spend a lot of time observing people work. And people might say that, you know, yeah, I have to get out on top of that tank and I have to access this. Or when we move rail cars, I'm concerned about this. And you can pull, extract that information, and it's very valuable. Next slide. So very easy, you know, to compile a list of five to ten activities, uh, rate each activity based on their exposure. We have a couple different kind of rating tools we use. And then just work to decrease that exposure in the workplace, you know, using the hierarchy of controls, which is what we're going to talk about here in a little bit. Next slide. So I wanted to talk a little bit about SIF potential in the, in the grain industry. Um, this is my list. It could completely be different from your list. This is just based on my experience. But I've identified uh, five things uh, in the in the workplace in the grain handling industry uh, that are concerns of mine, especially when we do audits and work with companies. I think some of them will probably be on your list and some of them may not. You may substitute some as well. So, uh, again, I would encourage you to, to go through that exer exercise of identifying these at your location. So the first is safe entry into grain storage structures. We're going to talk about that, combustible dust explosions, uh, falls to a different level, uh, moving vehicles, and then dangerous equipment. Next slide. So when we look at, you know, grain engulfment, and I'm, from a prevention standpoint, and I, I wrote an article um, in the fourth quarter of 2019. I think it might have came out in September or October. Um, and I took the idea of the hierarchy of, of controls and put it into grain engulfment prevention. And whenever we see these hierarchies, and we're going to see a few of them today, I love to talk about these. If you've been on a webinar before, you know I'll drill this one into everybody's head by the end of the day. Um, but 
we start at the top and those are the most effective strategies and the bottom is the least. So every step down is a lesser effective strategy for preventing something. So when we look at, at grain engulfment prevention, um, there is a direct correlation between the quality of the grain and then having to enter grain storage structures. And a lot of times that's the, the antecedent or the thing that kicks the dominoes into motion. And I'm not a grain quality expert, but I know enough after, you know, analyzing a lot of the data out there that grain quality has a direct correlation uh, to engulfment fatalities in our industry. And I think until we really get a good grasp of that and start to look at that uh, in all aspects as the cause and shift our focus, we're going to continue to see the incidents that we see. The next thing down would be, you know, engineering controls. And a lot of our engineering controls would deal with the grain quality piece. So the next effective way to prevent it is to have these engineering controls in place. So by engineering controls, we're talking about, you know, aeration fans, temperature monitoring, uh, things of that nature, larger gates uh, so we can move larger amounts of grain so things don't hang up, that kind of stuff. So, again, I'm not grain quality expert, but these are all things as we go through the process. We start at grain quality and then the engineering controls that most of them will, uh, will actually correlate to that. The third would be the administrative controls. I think everybody has these, right? These are your procedures, your permits, and that kind of thing. And then the least effective would be, you know, the personal protective equipment. So I'm not arguing with the fact that there are ways. It's very difficult to restrain somebody so that they're not pulled into the flow of grain and they're not engulfed more than waist deep and these things that the grain handling uh, uh, standard tell us. But those types of things are very difficult. The other piece, you know, is, is rescue. And I'm not arguing against rescue, but rescue is not a prevention strategy. It's very important to have rescue capability but it's not a prevention strategy. So I, I wanted to touch on this hierarchy today, and I think as, a, as an industry, we really need to get a hold of this grain quality piece, and I've, I've talked with several experts in this, uh, in this area, and they, they're in agreement with that. Uh, next slide. I wanted to talk a little bit, too, about this, the idea of zero entry mentality. So in, in a true zero entry mentality, into, and I'm talking about entry into, you know, grain storage structures, we wouldn't enter them at all. So in my travels and talking to people, you, you, you see people that say, yeah, we have a zero entry mentality, yet, you know, I'm still seeing all of these permits that require entry into these spaces for, you know, various reasons. And a zero entry mentality, you know, if we're, if we're going to make that claim, we need to stay true to it. So one company I worked with, um, I appreciated their approach. They said, we have a zero entry mentality. And what that means to us is we have a zero entry in mentality where the, uh, the potential for engulfment exists. When there are engulfment hazards, we do not enter. And I thought that's the shift that we need to, to, to make there. So if we, we look at that zero entry mentality, make sure that we are, what we're saying aligns with what we're actually doing. And again, it's, it's exhausting all options to eliminate the need to enter, you know, regardless of, of cost if you're going to go down that road. So I had a great conversation with a, with a manager down in Texas recently that um, he worked for a, one of the top three grain companies in the country, and he was explaining to me, he was working for a smaller company now, all of the efforts that they were taking uh, to try to eliminate the need for people to go into grain bins, period. And I just was so impressed by that approach. I think and that's, that's ultimately where we need to get to. Uh, next slide. I want to talk about permit, permits as well. So, you know, there's a requirement for permits. There's an exception out there in the, in the grain handling standard that I wouldn't recommend that anybody use. I think a permit is a very important piece of the entry procedure. And the word permit, you know, to me and, the, and what we teach people is this comes from the word permission. You know, I have to do uh, certain tasks and identify certain things before I get permission to go into a space. Like when I was a kid, I had to clean my room before I could get permission to go out and play. So what I would encourage folks to do is to evaluate their permits. And I've seen some very good permits over the years. And one in particular that I saw a couple years ago when I was working with a company was really a question-based approach. And it focused on hazard analysis. So it was, it was really asking questions to make sure that people were looking at certain things within that space and outside of that space to identify hazards. 
and and that question based approach it's a little bit longer of a permit but it's very interactive and i really like the approach that they took there um there's also you know i, I would consider it a, a layer layered approval process for permits so you know when i started in safety you you went and got a permit from your manager the manager was trained on confined space entry the employees were trained um, you filled out the permit and then the manager would actually uh, approve the permit and this has to be a very active process and the first time i was really involved with the layered approval process was probably about five years ago um, a manager a, a vp of ops had come from a larger company into a company i was doing some consulting for and he wanted to go to this layered approach and i was a little um uh, I, I didn't i was a little unsure about it at first because i just wanted to make sure that you know, if we added another layer on this, whoever was involved in that approval process was engaged in the process and knew enough about, you know, bin entry and those types of things. So we actually did that. So they had, you had to get a, a approval at your facility from the manager there. And then they had a list of other managers that you could contact as well. But one of the things that we did was we trained each one of those managers to ask, you know, somewhere between three and five questions when somebody called to get approval. So they were just asking a few questions, doing a little bit of analysis just to get really comfortable. So it's kind of like a second set of eyes. And it put a little bit, uh, another step, and it took a little bit more time. But in time, we found that uh, on several incidents, uh, in several uh, different uh areas where people are going into spaces that they that person that was the the approver that second approver actually identified something that was of concern so it taught me very quickly that there is some value in these layered approval processes and and many companies have these um, and if you don't it might be something that you want to consider now the flip side of that is i i was at a company this summer i was actually doing some some consulting for a, a small company that was working at a grain facility and the, the grain facilities were, we were all talking and the grain employees were telling me, yeah, we have this new approval process and we can't really do anything until we get pro approval from the corporate office. And I said, well, who, who approves it from the corporate office? And they said, you know, so-and-so. And I said, well, what, what, what is his job? And he, they said, well, he's in sales, he's in merchandising. And I said, has he ever been down here? And they, they said, no, has he ever, you know, been in a grain bin or, you know, does he does he know a lot about entry and the hazards? And they go, We're, we really don't know. And I said, well, when you call him, what does he say? And he just gives us approval. He does, does he ask any questions? No. And that's not the right approach. So it has to be an approach. I think there's a little training involved, um, some questions, that kind of thing. Next slide. I um, want to talk, too, about lockout tag, and I'm going to share a couple experiences as we go through this as well. So we all know that in, in grain bin entry, we have to make sure that any mechanical, hydraulic, and pneumatic equipment, which presents a danger to the employee inside of the space, is, is locked and, and tagged out. Um, and it, at first glance, it's really easy to say, well, this must be the stuff inside of the space, like, like a sweep auger. And we've got these 10 sweep auger uh, safety principles and you have to be aware of, you know, what state you're in because there are states like Iowa and Minnesota that don't accept these, that kind of thing. But really, it's, you know, we really need to look at this idea that it's anything not necessarily inside the space, but also outside um, that could cause a danger. So that would be anything that would, you know, fill a, a space while somebody's in it or possibly reclaim the material as well. Next slide. So I had a, a very interesting um, experience over the summer. I, I started working for a company, and, and we found an employee inside of a grain bin. He was using a, a vac to vac out some grain, and uh, we couldn't really find the attendant. So um, I asked the employee inside the grain bin to come out, and when I asked him, you know, did you lock anything out? And he wasn't even really familiar with lockout tagout at all, which – was a concern. So when we went up on the bin deck, we noticed that the drags there had not been locked out. And I, I brought this up to, you know, a couple of the people that were, were walking with me that day during the audit. And we said, uh, you know, this is, this is a hazard. This needs to be locked out. And they said, well, you know, if, if a little bit of grain comes down, it'll kind of sprinkle on top of them and he'll just exit the space. And I think, you know, exiting the space, exiting a grain bin sometimes is easier said than done, depending on the shape, configuration, what you got to climb over. Um, lighting, all those types of things. So I said, well, let's just walk through this. And we stood there and actually went through this calculation. Um, we had a 15,000 bushel per hour drag feeding the storage structure. Uh, that equals about 250 bushels per minute, which is about four bushels per sec second. We just threw in 56 test weight corn. We came up with 224 pounds of corn cascading out of the worker below. 
um, falling from a distance of 80 feet. It's like a refrigerator, as one of the employees said, falling on somebody. So this idea of lockout tagout, I think when we train, you know, examples like this are really important to use. Next slide. And I also want to touch today on the angle of repose. In, in my opinion, with the companies that I've worked for, this is a concept that is not well understood by many frontline employees, and I think it needs to be. Uh, it's the steepest angle at which an object can rest on an inclined plane without sliding down. So it's the angle that you could stack something without it starting to be unstable. And I think employees really need to understand this, this angle and how it applies to commodities. Next slide. So with corn, we have approximately anywhere from 21 and a half to 23 degrees, um, soybeans 25 degrees, wheat 25, oats 28. So you can, you know, kind of generalize this or take an average, maybe you're somewhere around 25, but teaching people of the angle of repose as it, as it applies to storage of grain, whether it's in a grain storage structure, maybe even outside as well. And you can quickly, if they know what a 25 degree angle looks like, maybe you just put the 25 degree angle right on the permit, they can quickly identify that, oh, that's a uh, SIF potential right there. I've got uh, grain that could slide. We're going to be, you know, in proximity with that. Our risk has gone above what we planned for. We need to step back and reevaluate what we're doing. So, you know, I'm aware of uh, an incident this this la in this last year where um, there was a fatality, and uh, the, the one of the witnesses told me that the angle of repose inside of the grain storage structure, and their estimate was 45 degrees, and we still have people inside of the bin. So very concerning. So angle of repose, very good concept to uh, to make sure that people understand. Next slide. So again, with engulfment prevention, um, you know, recognize that grain quality is a SIF precursor. Uh, this is zero entry mentality where grain engulfment uh, conditions exist. We talked about the importance of engineering controls. <clears throat> I didn't talk about storage management, but this is a this is a um, administrative control when you look at the hierarchy. This idea of storage management, and, and when I get out and talk to managers, I said one of the big challenges, and, and I've talked to a number of them, is you know we're, we're buying so much grain and filling all of our storage structures that we don't have room to, to rotate things from a quality standpoint, to move things when they, they get out of condition. And that makes it very hard for these facilities. So I wanted to touch on that as well. Uh, obviously, procedures for entry. We talked about a question-based permit, um, the permit approval process. And again, I do support you know having rescue available, well-trained, non-entry. Um, and entry types of rescues as well, and, and, and obviously make sure we train our employees. Next slide. So I want to shift to the second um, SIF type of event uh, incident on, on my list, and that's uh, dust explosion. So still waiting for um, the grain en engulfment stats to come out from last year. They should come out shortly, as well as dust explosions. But back in uh, 2018, there were 12 grain dust explosions reported in the U.S. Uh, eight of them uh, actually occurred at grain elevators. There were one uh, fatality, and four people were seriously injured. Next slide. And I think statistics are really misleading on this. Um, I believe, and I'm aware of uh, one company in particular that I heard had several grain dust explosions in the course of one year at their facilities. Um, but they never made the news because there was no black smoke, no loss of life, no major property damage. They were out in a rural setting, those types of things. But it's definitely a SIF precursor. Uh, this picture here, probably hard for, if you, if you haven't seen it or heard me talk about it before, um, hard to recognize. But this is a bucket elevator leg, exterior one. I walked by this um, during an audit. I walked by it. I took three steps backward, looked at my uh, escort and said, you have a grain dust explosion in this leg? And he said, yeah, it happened about six weeks ago. You didn't hear anything about it? And I'm their consult, okay? And I come around on a quarterly basis and do a lot of walkthroughs at facilities and stuff like that. And uh, I, I said, you know, no, I don't know anything about it. He goes, oh, I'm surprised they didn't tell you. I'm thinking, well, if they didn't tell me, then they, obviously this one didn't get uh, tabulated on the stats each year. So I think the statistics are misleading. We still have grain dust explosions uh, in the industry. I think it's a major, um, you know, SIF, the SIF potential there is huge, and it's something that we can't take our eye off the ball on this one. Next slide. 
So when we look at dust exposure and uh, prevention, um, the two things you know we can really control at the at our facilities is the the combustible dust and the ignition source. Um, dispersion is going to happen inside of of uh, grain storage handling equipment. Um, you can get levels below minimum explosive concentrations with aspiration and dust systems, those types of things. Oxygen, very difficult to limit that. You know, explosion suppression can do that to a point, but uh, you can't eliminate oxygen in a facility. And then, again, the containment and confinement in our equipment based on the nature of our business, it is what it is. So there are really two areas that I think, you know, at a facility that we can focus on. Next slide. And yet, you know, another hierarchy is, you know, how do you eliminate the hazards? And, uh, and then we can use engineering controls, and then we can use administrative controls. And I'm going to move through these uh, fairly quickly. We do every year a grain dust explosion prevention webinar with Grain Journal. Um, those are all in their archives as well, and I know we'll have another one this year. But it's, it's simple things on elimination. So we avoid uh, installation of horizontal surfaces where dust can accumulate, eliminate hidden areas where dust can accumulate. Eliminate the use of compressed air for cleaning surfaces. We know that that puts dust into suspension. Um, we can eliminate point sources of fugitive dust in the facility. These are leaks, things of that nature. Next slide. We can install smooth uh, ceiling and wall surfaces. I've seen people put uh, different uh, textures on them, different types of paint, those types of things the dust doesn't stick to. Uh, enclosed conveyance is huge. I've got a client investing a lot of money right now at one of their facilities that's going to minimize uh, fugitive dust, probably close to 95%, I bet. Um, install access equipment to hard-to-reach areas. I did an audit a couple of years ago at many facilities at a particular uh, company, and I could not believe how much effort and money they spent installing um, catwalks and, and different types of access to areas that were very hard to clean. And when they couldn't do that, they had rolling scaffolds on uh, different floors of the elevator that they could safely reach areas that were hard to reach. Next slide. You know, dust collection equipment, making sure that that's properly balanced, you know, pulling off of the bucket elevators, uh, conveyance, that kind of thing, properly rated uh, electrical classifications. Um, this This is something I see out in rural America sometimes. I think we call the local electrician, and I'm not sure that they – they understand the, the codes when it comes to combustible dust, and you find a lot of questionable installations out there. Next slide. Um, hazard monitoring equipment. You know, I spent uh, last week, I spent uh, several days, we exhibited at the uh, Ag Safety Director's Leadership Conference in Council Bluffs, and uh, there are 15, 20 vendors there, and I, I got some time to talk to um, one of the Hasmon companies, and just the, the level of technology that they're getting to now is pretty amazing. I think he was telling me that they read the sensor, I think, like eight times per minute or something, or eight times per second. Um, and we were talking about the testing of the systems. But motion detection, bearing temperature, belt alignment, um, these are just great investments. I, I call it cheap insurance out there. Um, I think they're great systems to have. They need to be properly maintained and tested. Um, there's a lot of nice testing equipment out there where you can test this stuff and, you know, talking to the manufacturers, they're saying, and the reps, you know, at least once a year, I would recommend to but making sure things are working as well. Uh, suppression systems work, oil addition systems as well, or, or more engineering controls. Next slide. Uh, pressurizing air areas to, uh, to reduce fugitive dust. Uh, preventing tramp metal from entering the product stream. You know, the, the grading at the truck dump is, is very limited in that approach. Um, this is a magnet off of a company that I did a, a, a lot of work with. Um, I kind of mentioned them earlier with their, their investment to make sure that people could access hard-to-clean areas, that they were installing a lot of magnets on receiving legs and stuff like that. These are all just, just great engineering controls out there. And the next slide. And when we look at um, administrative controls, again, when we look at the hierarchy, they're a little bit lower, but they're still uh, an effective approach. So that's, you know, making sure that you have your written housekeeping program that's got the responsibilities, the frequency, the acceptable methods for cleaning, you know, your hot work permit programs, uh, blowdown programs, blowdown permits, those types of things, uh, enforcing no smoking policies, that kind of thing. Next slide. 
So, you know, educating employees, contractors, and drivers on the hazards of combustible dust, um, particularly the, the smoking issue with drivers is always a concern when I talk to folks out there. Uh, cleaning techniques that minimize placing dust in suspension. You know, I've got a, a picture of a, a gentleman here that's doing some blowdown on a gallery floor. Um, the thing I will say about this was he had a permit, and they had actually locked and tagged out the equipment on this floor, which was a, a really good observation during the audit process. Next slide. And then preventive maintenance. You know, preventive maintenance, housekeeping, two things we can focus on. Um, I'm seeing a lot of companies that are having really effective uh, uh, preventive maintenance programs. Quite frankly, I don't care if they're on paper or they're in a safety management system. I, I prefer to have them in a safety management system that is kind of a work order system that kind of spits out what you need to do when. But I think you can manage it either way. And uh, I did want to mention again just, you know, I work with a, a small contractor in Northwest Ohio that's been doing a lot of testing and inspecting of hazard monitoring systems out there. And some of the data that they've provided me on the actual um, control points that are actually working in grain elevators, they're, they're sometimes finding over 50% of the actual control points are mislabeled, not hooked up, not functioning, systems are turned off. These are really important things, like I said earlier, just, you know, cheap insurance. So I think a testing and verification process for this HAZMON equipment is very important. Whether you have that done by a third party or do it internally. Uh, the equipment that I was looking at the other day, they had a, a small handheld device for $450 that allowed you to test all of their equipment to make sure that it was operating correctly. It was, it was excellent. Next slide. We'll switch gears a little bit, falls to uh, another level. I don't have a lot of info in here. We Again, we do a fall protection. We've done several fall protection webinars and fall hazard webinars for Grain Journal, and, they're, and they'll be in their archives. But, you know, falls are, are uh, have SIF potential, obviously. So falls while climbing ladders, you know, working from aerial lifts, uh, from work surfaces, falls from rail cars. You know, I have a gentleman here that's uh, – working on top of a rail car, and, and people always refer to the miles memo, and I only need to have it here, but if you have people working down the track another 50, 100 feet, and they're not under, you know, a, a fall arrest system, uh, that's SIF potential. Um, whether it's, you can argue the fact that this miles memo or not, the potential is still there. So a lot of companies have gone above and beyond, and I appreciate those efforts to expand these systems to wherever people uh, are working on top of rail cars, and they're pretty strict in their there are life safety rules that you, when you're up on top of a rail car, you have to be protected by fall protection. Next slide. So there is a hierarchy of fall protection, and uh, we go through elimination, passive systems, restraint, and personal rest. So we start at the top, every you know step down, less favorable, eliminating fall hazards altogether. You know I've seen a lot of companies very successful in relocating equipment so people don't have to climb ladders, get up on top of platforms, that kind of thing. Passive systems, guardrails, are fantastic. Um, they prevent people from reaching a leading edge. Uh, they don't have to be adjusted. It's not equipment you have to put on, that kind of thing. The next in line is restraint. Restraint is like that uh, dog on a chain. We rig up a system that prevents somebody from their center of gravity from actually going past the leading edge. And then personal uh, fall arrest, I think it is effective. The only thing is that somebody's already fallen. There's a lot of factors to consider with personal fall arrest as well, things like clearance distances uh, and things of that nature as well that you need to determine prior to using that. So this is the hierarchy of, of fall protection. And again, this is, you know, when we have a fall hazard in the workplace, this is the kind of the steps we work through. Uh, next slide. Want to move into uh, moving vehicles or struck by. And in the interest of time, I'm going to try to speed it up a little bit here. But struck by injuries are defined as an injury produced by forcible contact or impact between the injured person, object, or a piece of equipment. So this generally involves uh, vehicles, forklifts, semis, and loaders, skid steer loaders, could be rail equipment, those types of things. Next slide. Uh, a backover incident occurs when a backing vehicle strikes a worker who is standing, walking, or kneeling beside or under a vehicle. So these things are generally caused by um, the driver not being able to see the worker because there's some type of a blind spot with their equipment. Uh, sometimes the workers don't hear or ignore backup alarms. Uh, sometimes workers are trying to ret retrieve a tool or equipment. They walk behind something that they don't think is going to move. Um, and these are all causes of what we call backover incidents. Next slide. So 
a lot of different prevention techniques, and I didn't put these in a hierarchy, so they're in no particular order, but um, high, high vis and, 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 you know, reflective clothing I think is a, a great thing. Just make sure that it's properly rated in the event that you had somebody that was working in an area where there could be a flash fire, you know, synthetics, those types of things can be an issue. But I think any time we can distinguish the worker from the work environment and make it easier for a driver to see somebody and know where their location is is a, is a great effort. Next slide. Um, housekeeping, particularly around receiving areas as well. So this eliminates the potential for falls, uh, but also slips, trips, those types of things, which have consistently in our industry been the number one cause of, of injuries. Um, it's also important to store equipment properly. So one of the things that I'm a big fan of, if you've you know, studied continuous improvement and you're familiar with the 5S approach, uh, simple shadow boards in truck receiving areas or in vehicle traffic areas where tools are used. Um, and this is just an example that I know that as soon as, as soon as I'm done with the push broom and the shovel, it goes back in that place. It saves time when you're looking for it, and it also makes sure that it doesn't find its way underneath the truck and somebody uh, says, hey, I'm just going to run under there and grab that real quick. There have been, a fatal there's, have been fatalities in the industry over the years uh, in those types of instances. Next, next slide. You know, this idea as well of these internal traffic control plans, and I, I borrowed this image here from NGFA, um, and we did a webinar as well with Grain Journal on uh, moving vehicle hazards. So um, we go into a lot more depth than that. But it's really this idea of internal traffic control plans is coordinating the flow of moving equipment so that workers and vehicles don't kind of cross, cross paths. Um, it also involves establishing work zones around things like storage piles, storage structures, uh, some of the cooperatives that have fertilizer as well. We have the fertilizer storage buildings where there's a lot of loader traffic and we can establish work zones to keep people out of those areas or even establish a procedure for them to contact the person verbally and, and get physical and a physical acknowledgement by the person before they step into a particular area. Next slide. And, you know, cell phone usage, um, eliminating that in these traffic areas, work zones, receiving areas as well. Next slide. Um, other things, you know, using a spotter if we have vehicles that are backing up, um, equipping vehicles that they don't, you know, a lot of them come standard now with backup cameras, backup warning devices, those types of things, making sure those are operational. Again, defining work zones and then requiring that communication uh, between workers when entering work zones uh, between the actual worker and the driver. So you can say they don't enter at all, or if you do allow them to enter, they have to go through a process. And the process is I contact that operator on a radio. And then I get a physical confirmation. You know, he gives me a wave or something of that nature to say, yeah, he understands I'm in the work zone and he's going to stop and put his, uh, his brake on and wait till I leave the work zone uh, till he starts back up. Next slide. I, I did want to point out as well, training employees on blind spots is, is uh, really eye-opening. Um, NIOSH did a blind spot that blind spot study many years ago, and I'm not sure if they've updated it uh, lately or not, but if you go to Google or your search engine and, and pop in blind spot um, study, you'll find um, a lot of information out there on different types of vehicles, and they give you these images like you see here, this picture. So anything in gray on this particular um, loader here uh, would indicate that those are blind spots. Anything in yellow or has limited uh, visibility. Uh, it's one thing to show these to people. It's another thing to put an employee inside of a cab and then have people walk around and see if they can actually see where they're at. They get a true, um, true, really, I think, appreciation of the blind spots. Um, I think a lot of people that don't operate equipment like that, like, um, you know, I, I, I used to drive a forklift when I was younger. I, I appreciate the blind spots and what I can see and what I can't. But I think, you know, putting people on the seat and having them experience that, whether they operate the equipment or not, is, is pretty eye-opening. Next slide. And then I have uh, one here as well, establishing the red zone, in, particularly in receiving areas. So um, we worked with a client many years ago, and um, actually one of our online training programs, all of their employees were taking, and it was on, we have a program on truck dumps. And what we did was we took the idea of the red zone, which is a common um, safety measure that's in the rail industry. And it's basically anything within arm's length of a rail car. We we took that that act, you know, that same type of um, procedure and and put that in rail receive or truck receiving areas. So anytime somebody's within arm's length of the actual vehicle or the trailer, 
they're in the red zone, and that would require communication with the driver and that the driver has the vehicle in neutral and they set the parking brake. Um, this company here um, actually later actually painted red zones in their truck receiving areas, which is something unique that I've never seen anywhere else. Next slide. And I want to talk briefly about just dangerous equipment as well. So lockout tagout we touched on earlier. Lockout tagout also, you know, we remove guards, and there's three specific criteria that require lockout tagout. Very important. Um, we've done several webinars, again, on lockout tagout. I actually did a, a lockout tagout presentation at Exchange last year as well. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about just touch on uh, machine guarding uh, really quickly here. So next slide. So we have a lot of equipment in our industry that have what we call inward running nip points. So these are things like V-belts, and then you have rotating shafts, things of that nature. So guarding, in, in my estimation, depends on, you know, the company I go to and, and how robust their safety program is. I've seen companies that have done guarding uh, assessments and just done a fantastic job of guarding. And then I've seen companies like the picture on the left here that are still operating as if it were, you know, the 1950s, uh, where we have, you know, open belts and rotating shafts. So uh, those types of things, guarding, very important. Next slide. You know, inward running nip points on um, tail pulleys and head pulleys, things of that nature. So making sure, you know, they're depending on which way the belt's traveling, I have a point there that could pull somebody into a piece of equipment. And what I think about a lot of times, and I couple this with lockout tagout, is you know somebody's up there cleaning. They get in a, they want to clean some of the grain off the belt there. They get in kind of a precarious position. They get pulled into the tail pulley. Serious injury potential, right? Um, so we can guard those things with you know fixed guards that need to be removed, and then we know that whenever we remove a guard, or we have to disassemble it or take a cover off like that, then we have to take some bolts out or whatever it might be that I require lockout tagout. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> picture of rotating shaft. Um, find rotating shafts at a, at a lot of locations. The picture on the right here is just, you know, brand new equipment. And, you know, that's the ultimate, right? We have really no potential for an employee to get their hands or fingers anywhere near any of the uh, pinch points. Next slide. And then trippers. So, you know, not all facilities have trippers, but if you have a gallery floor, uh, a lot of open belts, trippers, those types of things. There's obviously a lot of different um, types of inward running nip points, pitch points, things of that nature with trippers. So on the left here, we've got one that's unguarded. And I had, a again, that company I talked about earlier that was doing things with the, making sure that people could get to those areas to clean and, and their machine guarding. And uh, this was the tripper that they had. And I've never quite seen a tripper that was guarded like this. So when we when we uh, note this in audits, this is something that we convey to uh, to the to the company that hey, that here, here's an example of kind of what we're looking for in these instances. Next slide. So, and we can move on to the next one as well. So, just a little on SIF prevention to kind of wrap it up today. I want to spend you know five or ten minutes. Uh, we're kind of bumping up against our hour here, but I want to talk a little bit about exposure. How to identify it? We'll touch briefly again on the hierarchy of controls. Um, talk about job hazard analysis, and then uh, life-saving uh, policies as well. Next slide. So understanding exposure is is um, really, you know, a, a concept I, you know, I, I hope that everybody has a good grasp of. <clears throat> um, about two or three years ago at our, our Jeeps regional conference, um, Luis Sanchez, he, he worked for BST, and then he works for DECRA now, and he came to speak, and I actually got to work with Luis for about two and a half years, and he's very was very instrumental on my approach to safety. And um, he, at, at the conference, talked about this understanding exposure and this idea of exposure-based safety. And, you know, as, a, as an auditor, you know, a lot of times I'll, I'll point some hazard out. It's up on the wall, and it's outside of a facility, and maybe there's a wire sticking out of a box that needs to be fixed. But the exposure there is very limited because until the employee comes in contact with the hazard, we don't have exposure. And where we have that exposure, that's where people get hurt. So it's focusing on these things where the employee interacts with the working interface, with their tools and equipment and those types of things that they use. That's where exposure exists. Next slide. So risk is inherent in, in many situations. So, you know, from the morning, from the time we get up in the morning, we, we plan on a certain level of risk. Hopefully when you get in your car, you, you put your seatbelt on because you know there's a level of risk you plan for. 
Now, if you're driving to work and it starts uh, to snow and there's freezing rain, the level of risk has gone above what we plan for. And when we can recognize that and get employees to the point where they can recognize that, we can step back and reevaluate our actions or behavior. It's like earlier when we talked about that angle of repose. If I can get employees to recognize that, maybe I have that angle right on the actual permit. They take a look and they see that the angle of repose on the grain inside of that storage structure is, is steeper than what it indicates. They can step back and evaluate their behavior. So uh, this idea of exposure is very important. Uh, the next slide. So there are many ways to identify uh, exposure. We talked about incident analysis. You can use that on your near-miss incidents, uh, non-serious injuries, serious injuries, those types of things. We've done webinars on job hazard analysis. You can do these for routine work and non-routine tasks. You know, the near-miss process we talked about earlier. Some of you may do behavioral observation processes. Those are great ways to identify exposure as well. And then auditing, uh, you know, having an audit process at your facility. It's not just looking for our conditions, but focusing on that exposure, which is that worker and that hazard where the two intersect. Next slide. And if you haven't seen it enough today, I'm going to hit you with it one more time. You know, the hierarchy of controls. And this is, you know, this is something, I, the one thing I enjoy about the auditing process, and it's something that I hope I'm always uh, able to do and healthy enough to get out and climb things and, and walk around with folks, is I usually have an entourage, and when people ask, uh, can how many people can come? It's it's limitless because really the the auditing process becomes a teaching tool, and we during that auditing pro process with frontline employees, if they're not aware of the hierarchy of controls, we we talk through this right away, and then as we do our audit each time we identify some type of exposure, we kind of talk about the best way to address it, and not putting band aids on things. So again, I you know this concept or this methodology is something that I'll continue to talk about and continue to to cover until I'm no longer able to to uh, to do it. Um, next slide. And then I want to talk too about non-routine work because um, this is an interesting concept because I, I wrote an article on this recently as well for Grain Journal um, and the idea of developing a non-routine work program. And th what the catalyst for this was uh, a, a grain engulfment fatality where somebody told me that you know, after the fatality, that oh, it was just routine work. This is just something routine that we do. And I said, you know, I, I think we need it as an industry to get away from this idea that um, entering grain bins is routine. To me, it's anything but routine. There's just too many factors to make it routine. Um, so I started to look into this idea of non-routine work programs, doing a little bit of research and that kind of thing for my article. And I called a, a colleague of mine who works for uh, one of the probably the top five grain companies. Uh, in the company storage wise and asked him a question about because I knew they had a non-routine work program um, And I said, what is your definition and, and a summary of it is he says any task that is not conducted at least quarterly uh, by the persons assigned the task is Non-routine work and I said so that would include grain bins. He says absolutely He says, you know a lot of times We don't empty those but once a year once every couple of years, whatever it might be he says, so yeah and I said, well, what, when they identify it as non-routine work, what does that trigger? What do you have to do? And he said, we have to do a hazard analysis and develop an SOP for entering that grain bin, how we're going to handle that. And uh, he said, then we, we, after we develop that, we do a training session and review it with everybody. So this idea of a non-routine work program, I think, is pretty interesting because we find a lot of sick potential, as we indicated in one of the first two slides I covered today, we're with non-routine work, uh, construction work. That's somewhat non-routine. Construction work can be construction work that's from an outside contractor or somebody internal. Next slide. And the last piece here um, before we get to questions is, um, actually I have one more slide, but um, is to really make sure that, you know, we have these life-saving policies. So there's, I've, I've heard many terms to describe these cardinal safety rules, uh, life safety, uh, policies, life safety tenants, all these different things. But, you know, I think about those policies, and you may have additional ones as well, but making sure, you know, lockout, tag out, these are all things that can save a life. Your confined space, grain storage structure entry, working at heights, uh, machine guarding, you know, mobile equipment, moving vehicles, hot work, smoking, fire prevention, that kind of stuff, and electrical arc flash. But making sure, you know, those are really tight and, and well communicated to all employees. And the last slide. 
So in conclusion, um, we've covered a lot of stuff today, and, and my time is, is right up at the end here. But I think, you know, creating a balanced approach between focusing on both non-serious and serious injury and fatality prevention is critical. Um, and, and look to implement, possibly, if you're not already doing this, some of these SIF identification processes. Uh, the near-miss or incident analysis, um, you know, if you can't do that in lieu of that, I mean, the employee engagement is a simple way of doing it. You know, hazard analysis, things like JHA and, and exposure observations as well are all great, uh, great tools. And, Kendall, we can go to the, uh, to the questions now. Okay, thank you so much for a great presentation, Joe. <clears throat> this does conclude the presentation portion of our event today. We will now begin our Q&A session. If you have not yet submitted your questions, please do so at this time. Okay, Joe, our first question today. Can you let us know who are dust explosions reported to? Um. Usually, well, I, I don't know who they're reported to. I know that Purdue does a tremendous amount of work to um, to gather the data, and you know, I can only I can only make an assumption that they get most of their data from news outlets, um, similar to those that are used uh, when you get your safety blasts and things of that nature. Um, but I, as I said earlier, I think the statistics are somewhat misleading. I think the grain dust explosions, um, you know, I'm aware of one that just happened here recently. Um, I was aware of it the pretty much the same day, but it never really hit the news until two weeks later. Um, so, again, I think those statistics are somewhat misleading based on the event, where it is, and really what the outcome was. Okay, our next question. With a focus shift away from small incidents to CIFs, do you expect to see an uptick in small incidents? I, I think there needs to be a balanced approach. I don't think it's a, a shift completely away. Um, and I think this shift, you know, if we look at the numbers, the, the shift with many larger organizations toward toward CIFs has been ongoing for quite some years. I mean, I, I mentioned earlier that the company that I had worked for back in the mid-2000s had gone gone down that road, and, and I know some of the larger companies as well in our, in our industry have done it. Um, so I don't necessarily believe that that's um, – that's the case. I think anytime you put in any of these any of these types of uh, systems we were talking about, like near miss or JHA or incident analysis, it's only going to have a direct correlation to the the non serious injuries as well. Okay. And next, do you believe that a layered approach to permit approval would excuse me would decrease the amount of entries into a grain bin? I don't know if it will decrease the amount of entries into a grain bin. I know that um, in in my experience, what has happened, and I've se I've seen this firsthand, that it we we talked about you know this idea of risk going above plan, um, that that layered process, what that can sometimes do by somebody from the outside, maybe somebody from another facility, or maybe it's your safety director or regional safety person, asking um, some pointed questions. Uh, around entry to make sure that they're very comfortable can some kind, sometimes raise that level that they, they feel of risk above what they plan for, and that in turn causes us to step back, right? It, it gets back to kind of like that non-routine work. What are we going to do? We're going to step back. We're going to reevaluate. Maybe we develop an SOP. So I don't know that it, it's going to decrease the amount of entries. I think if we want to decrease the amount of entries in, into grain storage structures, you know, we're not probably going to rely on an administrative control. We're going to have to go back to that hierarchy of controls. And if we remember what that looked like, we had at the top, we had grain quality uh, as the leading uh, thing there. And then underneath that, we had engineering controls, which were how we're building grain bins and how they're designed and some of the equipment. So I don't necessarily think it's going to decrease the amount of entries made. Um, but I think it's a, a process that if you're not doing it, your company, it's, it's worth looking into. And I think maybe, you know, with those types of things, you know, I, I only have my experience to base that on. So, you know, I would reach out um, to some of your Jeeps colleagues or your colleagues in NGFA and, and, and benchmark them and see kind of what they're doing, what's working well, what they've had problems with, that kind of thing. 
Okay, that is all the time that we have for questions today. I want to thank everyone for their participation. If your question was not answered, it will be sent forward to our presenter. And that is all that we have for today. I want to go ahead and thank our sponsors, M&M Specialty Services and VAA LLC for their support in bringing you today's webinar. And I also want to thank Jeeps and our presenter, Joe Milnick, for joining us today. Jeeps provides the best networking, education, and professional development for all levels of experience in the industry. Where can Jeeps help you? To start, they can enhance their your education through online training, local meetings and events, expand your network of colleagues, industry leaders, and create new friendships, and help you meet people that can help you. It connects you with 26 chapters across North America, industry leaders and experts that are only a call or click away. To learn more about what Jeeps can do for you, please visit jeeps.com slash membership. As a reminder, this webinar has been recorded and it will be available for viewing on greatnet.com within 24 hours. All registrants will also receive an email containing a link to the recording and the presentation slides. The next webinar in the Jeeps Grain Journal Educational Webinar Series will be held on Thursday, February 20th at 10 a.m. Central Time. Jared Heitzler of Martin Engineering will be giving a presentation called, Are You Doing Enough to Reduce Injuries from Belt Conveyors? We hope to see you there. I want to thank you all.